Hey everyone, and welcome to Tony for- I won't let you do that to Nemissa! I mean Tony for you. Honestly, I've been feeling quite conflicted with the newest news of Soul Hackers 2. The general discourse around the game seems to be positive, and everyone also seems to have loved the original Soul Hackers. The handheld entries in the Shin Megami Tensei series are beloved for good reason. SMT4 and 4 Apocalypse are what got most people into the series, Devil Survivor is touted as having some of the best writing in the genre, and Strange Journey is an incredibly mature and philosophical story. There's one that doesn't get talked about as much, and when it does, there really isn't much to say. Shin Megami Tensei Devil Summoner Soul Hackers is a game everyone likes, but I hate. I hated this game so much when I first played it. It still sits comfortably as the second worst game I've played in the entire series, next to SMT If, and continues to be an odd disconnect between me and the wider SMT community. I have a lot of grievances with Soul Hackers, and I want to explain why I dislike this game so much, but also give credit where credit is due, as I don't want this to be a blind hate video. I'm going to summarize the entire game, and then go into detail about what I like and dislike about everything. From the narrative, characters, art direction, musical direction, setting, etc. With that said, obviously there will be spoilers about the game, so keep that in mind when watching. Let's talk about the game. Before we get into the video, I'd like to talk about today's sponsor, Baiyi. If you've ever browsed around for merchandise, you know that the best of the best is only in Japan. But them's the breaks, right? Well, not anymore, thanks to today's sponsor, Baiyi. This is a Japanese website that can place bids and orders on your behalf without any ridiculous markup most resellers have, and send it right to your door. With their wide variety of storefronts, you can find almost anything you'd want, with Yahoo Japan Auction, Rakuten, Mercari, and even Amazon Japan. The coolest piece of merch you might not have even known existed is right at your fingertips. They offer support in several different languages, and ship worldwide, so no matter where you are, Baiyi's got you covered. They offer several different payment and shipping methods as well, so don't worry about anything. This truly is a website for everyone. If that wasn't good enough, for those who sign up using the link in the description below, you'll get 2,000 yen off your first purchase using the website. If you're interested, sign up and browse with a cool 2,000 yen voucher. Thank you Baiyi for sponsoring the video. Soul Hackers starts setting the scene of an urban modernization project uprooting what was once a small country town into a bustling metropolis in only five years. Living under its own city-wide online network, the people are connected in a way they never knew possible. You play as John Hacker, also known as Kenichi Seno, also also known as Codename Sanagi, a young man who's part of an elite hacker group known as Spookies. You and your friend Hitomi's goal in the beginning is to hack into and gain access to the new Paradigm X, which is a beta alternate reality being pushed by Algonsoft. When you hack into the company's servers, a strange voice calling himself Kidnap calls out from the computer. He lets you know the cops are on their way and promises to meet with you again. The game starts off really strong, setting the scene and establishing a bleak light cyberpunk aesthetic that does a great job of hooking people in. With what little we know, the player can understand that you and your friends are the scrappy underdog hackers living in a perpetually online world. After going home, meeting your family, and decrypting an email from Spookies, your new destination is to meet at the new Spookies HQ. After meeting with your leader, Spooky himself, he asks how Hitomi usually acts. Everyone picks sexy because it gives her the best spells. This is an incredibly important decision they portray as an offhand remark. Either way, Spooky shows you his newfound gun-type PC, and leaves it with you in hopes of losing the people who started following him after he picked it up. After much anticipation, it's finally time to go into Paradigm X. Some NPCs explain how Paradigm X will have virtual streets, movie theaters, and even pet shops. It truly is the city that never closes. Finally, you're dropped into a very dreary overcast city to explore. Eventually, you come across a blimp showing the news, conveniently airing a piece on Paradigm X's completion. There are two men on screen, Kadokura and Nishi, or as I like to call them, Evelor the Evil and literally Satan. Turns out they're giving everyone in the city a free computer, but we're smart enough to know that nothing is free in this world. Skipping ahead, you almost have your souls eaten by a strange entity in cyberspace, but are saved by Kinap from before. He informs you that with his help, you will relive the memories of past individuals and vision quests through touching souls. The first vision quest has you in the shoes of Urabe, infiltrating Algon HQ to gather data to give back to Kinap. The man Urabe fights with demons, and uses the gun-type PC you were saddled with just minutes before to summon them. After some dungeon crawling, before Urabe can give the data back to Kinap, he is attacked and killed by a man named Finnegan, and it seems they have a history. Back in reality, you remember, during the vision quest, Urabe inputted the password for the gun-type PC, so why not crack it open? When you do, an error flashes on the screen, and a bright ball of light shoots out of the PC and into your friend Hitomi. 
Your friend is now possessed by a demon named Nemissa. That's enough of the play-by-play, -play, but essentially that is the intro to the game. With the help of the rest of the spookies, you uncover the secrets behind Paradigm X and Algon Soft, and through Keynap's vision quests, you come to know of the Phantom Society working to steal souls. After this, we'll be getting into the real spoilers, so get ready. Let's talk about the story proper. The goal of the game is to uncover the plots of the Phantom Society, a shadowy Illuminati-like organization controlling history from behind the scenes. This organization recruits devil summoners, like the antagonists you fight throughout the game, and whose plans currently are to harvest the souls of Amami City's residents. Over the course of the game, you and Nemissa ingratiate yourself in the secret world of Devil Summoners by using the hidden shops and demon fusion utilities. The early game is used primarily to set the tone of the game, which with characters like Carol J fighting you multiple times and dropping notes to reveal important information is usually light. Carol J specifically on his second fight just quits the evil organization after being possessed by a demon he summoned. Makes you think the organization really isn't that scary, but the game flip-flops on this a lot. The vision quests you go on over the course of the game serve as a way to teach the player new mechanics and intricacies about gameplay as well as foreshadow the next objectives. The early vision quests explain very sparingly the plans of the Phantom Society and are actually a very clever way of explaining the game's mechanics. Shortly after your second vision quest, your sister is now in a trance, and to fix her you have to hop into Paradigm X. Luckily, there's a random guy in the VR art museum who's willing to help us in exchange for running around the paintings and solving puzzles. You have to go into three paintings, two of them are incredibly annoying and one of them is actually pretty cool, but I'll get more into that in the gameplay section. Obviously, at the end you have to fight the man who offered to help us, as he's a devil summoner, and then go and save your sister. Another boss fight. This one in particular is extremely weird as there's no feedback that you're actually hitting him, but eventually he will go down. Back in the real world, your sister is safe, but now your dad is in a trance too. What a waste of time. Oh well. After some more time, you're attacked by Muis, and after defeating him and a prolonged chase scene to the automotive plant, you're sucked into cyberspace, where the real Muis is, and he says Nemissa, the demon possessing Hitomi, is the one who governs death, and leaves. Once things settle down, Finnegan, the devil summoner from Urabe's questline, is onto us, and wants to settle things once and for all. He kidnaps fellow Spookies member Yuichi to give us a little incentive to meet with him. Once you track him down and put a stop to his evil deeds, the newly freed Yuichi is acting very strangely, but no one seems to really care much. Upon returning to Spooky's HQ, you realize your own city ID has been deleted. This is an incredibly intense thing to have happen, especially after establishing how online the entire city is, essentially erasing you from existence. Despite this, it really doesn't matter that this happens, and doesn't impact the story or gameplay at all. In fact, you get a new one pretty soon. After another dungeon, this time fleshing out Six's character in the VR Haunted Mansion, the Spookies return to HQ and finally piece together that the trances people are going into and the Phantom Society are related. After this revelation, you step out of HQ only to meet a woman named Mayon, who strapped plastic explosives to your trailer and tries to kill you. Another really hardcore moment where you have to fight for your life as the other members of Spookies get the explosives off the vehicle. After beating her, she activates the bombs, blowing the entire parking garage up with her in it, as you drive off to safety. Yeah, she dies trying to take you down. This entire exchange didn't accomplish much, but sends the message that the society is really on its last nerve. Shortly after, you find out the Phantom Society is using microchips for nefarious purposes. Luckily, Lunch, another member of Spookies and expert in hardware, has his father employed where the microchips are located, and you can head over there. Finally analyzing the chip from the source, you find out they're using it to harvest human souls. The analysis is cut short by the factory manager who is actually a demon named Shemyaza in disguise. Big surprise, you fight him and beat him. Returning to headquarters, Spooky concocts a plan to code a virus to infect Paradigm X and expose the truth to everyone. But shortly after, everyone in Spooky's has their identity revealed and are labeled as cyber terrorists. All members, except Spooky himself, resulting in everyone on the team seeing him as a traitor and abandoning him. Except you. Now completely out of leads, Keynap shows up again to pull us into another vision quest. You are now Dark Summoner Naomi, contacted by Nishi, one of the totally not evil heads of Algonsoft, and are tasked with fighting one of the two demons underneath the city. The boss you choose to fight here will actually change the skills of the final boss of the game, whether it's more magical or physical based. Whichever your decision, once it goes down, the air turns to poison, and Dark Summoner Naomi dies. Kidnap returns and explains how man and god cannot coexist. An entity named Manito is residing below the city, the name of which certain demons like Muis were screaming seemingly randomly before. Either you kill him or he kills all of humanity. Nothing much else is explained about Manito at this time. 
Regardless, you go back to headquarters, and Spooky wants to go ahead with the big hack exposing Algonsoft. Turns out, in Algon headquarters, a demon has created a domain around the entire building and is wreaking havoc in Paradigm X. After beating it, Hitomi, Nemesis' host body, feels her personality leaving her. You return back to base, essentially accomplishing very little and still being completely in the dark about what's going on. At HQ again, Yuichi, who was acting strangely before, is revealed to have been mind-controlled by the Phantom Society, and tells us all of the Spookies were kidnapped and transported to a mommy monolith. This next dungeon is incredibly long, and essentially boils down to running around and flipping switches marked with certain letters to spell out words. Near the top, you meet Katakura from before, who tells us that he is a member of the Phantom Society, but Nishi is the real mastermind. Once again, nothing we don't already know. He seems crazy, but doesn't fight you oddly enough. Catching up with Nishi, he transforms into Demon Azazel. After the battle, with all of his dialogue, he basically says nothing of importance to the plot. Really basic evil villain stuff. At the top, you find Spooky himself, who is possessed by Sethanael. You fight for your life, and at the end, it doesn't look like Spooky is able to make it. Kinap shows up again and it's finally time for the exposition dump. Essentially, Manitou is a pure spirit, a force of nature who has no soul or sense of self, but is the antithesis of the mortal world. The being is the great spirit inhabiting all things, and requires balance, but when the balance is tipped, Manito unconsciously fights back. With humanity's influence infecting it, Kinap sealed Manito into the earth and created Nemissa as a spirit who could kill Manito if the need arose. At this point, I was asking what the goals of the Phantom Society were, and if you were too, you won't find out, as it's never explained. Either way, you're finally at the end, where you find yourself in the ruins of the last vision quest Kinap sent you on. Going through this, you find Kadokura, who transforms into a demon, and after his defeat, you fight Manito right after, so be prepared. After the fight, Nemissa explains how Manito is crying out to die, and explains how humans and spirits cannot live together. Nemissa finally leaves Hitomi's body, returning to Manito, and the game immediately ends. The end. With that summary out of the way, I now get to explain why I really didn't gel with this story. Over the course of the game, the intro was fantastic, and it was a very distinct line downwards in my enjoyment as it went on. It seems like the vast majority of plot points in this game are just vaguely tied together events simply as a means to an end. Side characters and antagonists show up just to explain things and leave, or tasks are set in front of you that seem to accomplish nothing in the grand scheme of things. Carol J, the first Phantom Society member, literally just quits after the second fight. You save your sister from the soul-eating chip only for your dad to get infected literally right after. Characters like Mayon are sent to kill you only for them to die, and over the course of all of this, plot points are brought up and never explained, like the Phantom Society's motives in the first place, whether or not people even know Nemissa existed, or if only the player and Hitomi knew, or why technology specifically was used to harvest souls, rather than basic possession, which has been shown to happen. Quite a lot in fact. Don't even get me started on the Yadagarasu. This was an organization diametrically opposed to the Phantom Society, and has fought against them for who knows how long. You meet members of this faction all throughout the game, like Rei Reho and Ginkgo, but it's never explained who they are, what they do, or what they're trying to do. The members simply appear to tell you what's going on as a convenient plot device, or sometimes just to make fun of you. I neglected to mention them in the plot summary as they pretty much have no actual importance to the story, and are never explained. Then again, neither is the Phantom Society, so I guess it's only fair. Characters are extremely underdeveloped, like Yuichi, who's a walking plot device, and Lunch, who only exists to have a family member who works for Algon and gives us an easy in for information. The only characters that were somewhat interesting or had any development were Spooky, Six, and Nemissa. Spooky himself doesn't really have much time to develop, and the majority of what he says and does doesn't amount to much. Like the big hack to reveal the truth at the end, which literally doesn't matter at all and only results in him dying. His previous affiliation with Algon doesn't really matter either, as it's implied that he has some way to get into Algon's servers at their building. But they're hackers, so whatever the plot needed, it had an explanation for anyway. Six had a small amount of development when you're at the VR haunted mansion, with his sister's death weighing on him. This was a result of the microchip harvesting his soul to be fed to Manito. Why the souls needed to be tortured before being fed to Manito, I'm not sure. This entire escapade results in him instantly overcoming his trauma and it never being talked about again. I'm not complaining that every character doesn't have enough depth, but what we do get is so unremarkable or out of left field that they all feel like non-sequiturs. I don't really get the feeling that much of the plot was of any real importance, and realistically, if Keenap showed us the final vision quest and told us to destroy Manito in the beginning, this all could have been skipped. Obviously this couldn't have happened, since this is a video game, but it doesn't stop me from thinking most of it is inconsequential. It feels like 90% of this game is finding out what's going on, and even by the end, I still don't even know. 
The only thing I know by the end is the only two characters I kind of liked, that being Spooky and Namissa, are both essentially dead. Great. Let's talk about the main characters individually. Characters are an important part of any RPG. If the characters you fight for justice alongside are memorable, it can elevate the story tremendously. Sadly though, I think in this aspect, Soul Hackers is incredibly lacking. I'll talk about the Spookies now and give a brief summary of their role in the story. Spooky, or Masahiro Sakurai, yes that is his real name, is the leader of the Spookies and former Algonsoft employee. The one who developed a way to hack into Paradigm X, and the one who gave you your gun type PC. Most of his plans end up going nowhere and ultimately his entire role is just to drive around the trailer that is Spooky's HQ. Six, or Shingo Sako, has a macho man exterior, but a scaredy cat personality. With his traumatic past of accidentally killing his sister, his role in the story is... Um, I don't really know. Six got himself into a trance despite everything that happened in the story thus far. His soul is transferred into the VR haunted mansion in Paradigm X, where he's in a catatonic state speaking to his late sister. Turns out he killed his sister by accidentally pushing her down the stairs. Pretty dark. The way to save him is to kill the image of his sister and pull him out. Once saved, Six quickly overcomes his sister's death, and understands keeping her memory doesn't involve constantly obsessing over the trauma. A bit too clean of a resolution for this bombshell of a character moment, but that's just about all we get when it comes to that, so don't think about it too much. Yuichi, or Yuichi Haga, is a member of Spookies who has the dumbest codename ever. His name is Yuichi, and his secret hacker codename is Yu-Ichi. Awesome. He's a walking plot device whose only role is to get kidnapped, then mind controlled, then be the only one that isn't kidnapped. Lunch, or Junosuke Kitagawa, is a member of Spookies whose entire role is to have a dad who works at Algonsoft. The story he tells is about a child who hates his dad for representing the evil company ruining the world, but the reveal that his dad is simply doing it to keep his family safe is only just overshadowed by the fact that moments after the entire world starts to end. I'm not really sure who we're supposed to root for. At least Lunch's father ends up helping us near the end though. Honestly, he's the only member that serves a legitimate purpose, as he specializes in hardware and is the main character to uncover the microchip's true purpose. Kind of. The only bad thing about Lunch is that aside from this splash art, he never actually eats lunch. Nemissa is the only other main character, and she honestly is pretty great. When you first meet her, she immediately conveys a confidence and inquisitiveness about the world that is quite endearing. Most fights in the game involve her making fun of enemies or lightening the mood in some way. The arc she goes through over the course of the game when she realizes what's at stake is incredible as well. When she first appears, she seems to care very little about humanity, and also doesn't care about her host body Hitomi's free will either. Hitomi's role in the story is kind of an abstract hell in and of itself if you really think about her being a passenger in her own body, but don't think about it too much. As the story goes on though, she begins to understand her role much more and even empathizes with humans. Her departure at the end of the game is a part that stands out as a great character moment. Basically what I'm trying to say is this game lives and dies, story-wise, based on how much you like Nemissa. She is a great character, but the rest of the game is so lackluster, she can't prop it up by herself. You may have noticed I judge characters based on how they contribute to the understanding of the themes of the game, or push the plot forward in some way. Based on my description of these characters, it's quite obvious they fail to enhance the story or enrich the understanding of the game's themes at all. Aside from Nemissa, none are particularly important individually, and only exist to establish the group part of Spooky's hacker group. Alright, so if the story isn't good, and the characters as a whole aren't good, then it must be the gameplay, right? Not even close. The combat system for this game is much like the combat systems of the SNES Shin Megami Tensei games, with a rose system and six total party members. Physical attackers in the front, magical attackers in the back, it all makes sense. The demon alignment restrictions are mostly gone thankfully, so you can have pretty much any demon combination you would want. There's a metric ton of demons to choose from too, which is great, but an odd amount of them are not recruitable sadly. You choose every party member's actions and watch them go at the end. Pretty simple and works for what it is. The problem though lies with the demon loyalty system. You may have noticed that the demon party members have not only the chosen skills and spells they've learned, but also the go command which allows the demon to choose an action on their own. The action they take is based on their personality type. For all intents and purposes, there are a total of 5 personality types, and I'll briefly explain what they are. Calm demons have AI to choose what's best for any given scenario, like area of effect spells against multiple demons, healing injured party members, etc. Dumb prefer to use the go command, Wild prefer physical attacks and physical damage skills, Sly prefers using magic attacks and status ailments, and finally Kind likes guarding, healing, and buff-like support magic. Doesn't sound so bad as a concept, but where it really starts to fall apart is the application of these personalities. 
A demon has a loyalty meter displayed in the top right of the battle UI. Performing actions that they like will increase loyalty, and performing actions that they don't will decrease it. You might be asking, what happens when the loyalty is low? Well, the demon will disobey you. Yes, as in they may literally do absolutely nothing on their turn. That sounds horrible, but okay. You just have to grind them up by using the go command and get their loyalty to max before any big fight, right? Well, surprise, even if they're at max loyalty, there's still a chance that they'll disobey you. Even if you're telling them to perform an action that they aren't opposed to. I can't even begin to explain how utterly awful this system is. Instead of a cool system where you're rewarded for using skills your party likes, it's purely an added layer of randomness on top of the already somewhat random nature of turn-based RPGs. The game isn't very difficult, but you will suffer some deaths from this system, an outcome completely out of your control. Earlier on, the system isn't a problem as Nemissa can basically annihilate anything in your path, but later on in the game, bosses require levels of buffs and debuffs. This is completely fine, and expected for a Shin Megami Tensei game, but imagine how much harder it is when if you get unlucky, you could just get destroyed in one turn because your max loyalty demon decided not to cast a healing spell or reflect magic. This really starts to be a problem for bosses like Azazel and Katakura, where in Azazel's case, you pretty much need to use the first few turns casting Tetrakarn and using buffs, since his physical attacks are so potent they one-shot the main character resulting in instant game overs. Katakura especially has a move called Ultimate Laser, which does massive almighty damage to every character in the front row, and requires buffs and debuffs to be even remotely defended against. Imagine how frustrating it would be to lose a fight because your max loyalty demon decided that literally dying was preferable to casting the same spell they casted a million times before this point. Let's talk about some good parts of the game to end things off. The music is fantastic all around. From the overworld theme, individual dungeons, the battle themes, they're all usually amazing. The sound design overall is very good. Even aside from the music, the sound effects are impactful and fit right at home in this technologically advanced cyberpunk world. The dungeon design is overall very good as well. Aside from some stinkers, specifically the VR art museum being extremely tedious with its overly long puzzles and trial and error warp pads, the main dungeons are fun to explore. Usually big and varied, with a wide variety of demons to recruit, to help change things up. It's a relatively short game as well, which leads to constant forward movement in the plot and nothing really overstaying its welcome. The aesthetic of the game is overall really great, with the dark city streets setting the atmosphere, as well as all of the dungeons following a theme. The real world dungeons all have an element of realism, whether it be factories, old office buildings, and the like, while the Paradigm X dungeons explore a more fantastical yet grounded setting, with the aforementioned VR Art Museum's chessboard garden and the Haunted Mansion's otherworldly atmosphere being standouts. This took a lot longer to explain than I initially thought, but it just goes to show the disconnect I feel in regards to this game. I wanted so badly to enjoy this game, but as it went on, the charm wore off and the frustration set in. If you enjoyed this game, I really don't want to take anything away from you, as I can see why people might like it. If you made it this far and enjoy the game, thanks for hearing me out. I wanted to put all my cards on the table before Soul Hackers 2 was released. I might catch a lot of flack for this video, as Soul Hackers is a beloved game in the series for many people, but I thought it was important to go against the grain a bit, since I feel so strongly about it. The great visuals and music can only do so much for a game so unremarkable. The useless characters, half-baked story, and needlessly frustrating battle system stomp on any enjoyment I could have had with this game. Let me know what you think of this game in the comments below, or whether or not you agreed with any of my arguments. Special thanks to Anton, Frankie Stoned, Heavenly Potato, James Taylor III, Konyuna, MegaX454, Mr. Eight Eyes, Picaro, The Toaster Messiah, VideoGamer75, and many more for supporting the channel on Patreon. If you'd like to support, check the link in the description below. Thanks for watching this Soul Hackers critique, and I'll see you in the next Tony for You. Have a good one.